Now let's get stuck into it, shall we? Oh, no, no, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> no, 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 no. What is going on? Thank you. Oh, it's good to be here in person. I'm, I'm sick of video conferencing software like Zoom. I'm sick of chatting to people on there. Mainly because I had a gag that was working for ages when I was talking to friends on video conferencing software and it stopped working. I'll, I'll tell you the gag, basically what you do. I'll gesticulate more than usual and out of nowhere I'll just freeze. <laughs> and then my friends will be like, oh no, Tom, there's been a technical error. And I'll hold it for a few more seconds and then I'll go, hey. <laughs> and it's, look, it goes okay in this setting, but in a Zoom setting, that's some of the funniest shit you'll ever see. It's big laughs every time. Well, particularly the first five times I did it, but then the fifth time, and certainly the last time I did it, I was talking to two female friends on Zoom, and I was talking, and I was gesticulating, and then I froze. And they were like, oh no, Tom, there's been a technical error. And I held it for a few more seconds, but this time I held it for too long, because they just went back to talking to each other. <laughs> and then one of them started saying how she currently has a UTI. <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> that sounds private. But then I'm like, I've heard women talk publicly about having UTIs, but then I thought, I don't think this particular friend had ever told me anything about her genitalia, but by the time I've been thinking it through, I've left it too long. I can't do the reveal halfway through the story about the UTI. Then it makes it look like I did this so I could hear about the UTI. So I'm like, I just need to get out of the Zoom call. But then I realise I can't fucking move. Not only that, I can't move my eyes. Because it's one thing if I do a big reveal, it's another if they just see... Like, that's way creepier. So I'm like, okay, I've got to maintain eye contact with the camera, use my peripheral vision to look at my screen to see when they're not looking at their screens and then make some sort of move when that happens. So I legitimately sat there completely still for about a minute looking at my screen with my peripheral vision and then I picked a point where I thought they weren't looking and I just went, bam, right? I just shut my laptop <laughs> as quickly as possible. I'm like, hopefully that worked. I opened it back up. I'd been logged out of the Zoom, thank God. I got now WhatsApp thread. I'm like, oh no, there's been a technical error. I didn't admit. <laughs> What had happened then on the computer went back into Facebook Messenger, clicked the link, logged back in. They were smiling. They were talking about something else. They didn't seem mad at me. I was like, thank God. And then she told me about her UTI. Uh, so this is a graph of the purpose of that last story. Yeah, I've got some more graphs for you. Oh, sorry, it's logged out of the... Fuck, sorry. Sorry guys, this is what I was looking at before the show to make myself a bit more comfortable. I didn't, didn't actually get a chance to go through it. I might go through it now, actually, if, if that's okay with you. Uh, so, so I'm quite nervous. Um, make mistakes intentionally, and that's what this bit is. Um, oh, you're not an audience. You might think you are, but you're something different. And that's all from me, guys. Thank you so much for coming. Hope you had a good time. Visual aids are your friends. I'm already doing that. Visual aids are your friends. I'm already doing that. Visual aids are your... Oh. What's your name, sir? Chad. Chad, cheers. Oh, Chad, what, what makes you tick? Nerd stuff. Appropriate. <laughs> Blow steam beforehand, I did that. I won't tell you how, but I did it. <laughs> Pay attention to your body. That's actually how I blew off the steam beforehand. <laughs> That's the end of that article. Sorry, guys, now I've just got to log into PowerPoint. <laughs> Sorry, it's an old email. Oh, I hate these. Uh, it's the ones on the sides that get you. Like, is my neck horny? I'm gonna go with it. Yep. All right. Sorry, guys. Um. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's horny. This is fantastic. We can't believe it. Um, so, uh, this is a graph of how rude it is to hold up each finger by itself. As you can see, the middle finger, by far the most rude. Now, this is my excitement seeing you topless as it relates to how many nipples you have. As you can see, a peak there at two, that's because of horniness. 
The second more dramatic peak? That's curiosity. That's... If you've got three nipples, piss off. If you've got nine, give me a look. I need to see that. Uh, so this is some data from my life. From a few years ago, I went on a date with a girl called Sandra. And this is her enjoyment of different aspects of the date. Uh, so as you can see, she gave me eight out of ten for the venue, which I chose. Uh, she gave me seven out of ten for the rapport over the course of the date. Also gave me seven for my clothes, which I also chose. She gave me nine out of ten for my enthusiasm. Uh, but as you can see, only one out of ten for the post-date survey. <laughs> Sandra did not enjoy the post-date survey. Uh, this is some data from last year. I stopped recording in September because, as you can see, there's not much to go on. But to be fair to me, a bit of something going on there in March. Uh, this is a graph of how many times a girl blew me a kiss last year. As you can see, 0.5 there in March. That's because she says it was a yawn, but I know what I saw. There were two of us. We disagreed, so it was 0.5. That's the appropriate place to draw the line. Uh, so this is a, a club that I've always wanted to be a part of, but I also have a bit of a gripe with the definition of the Mile High Club. If I could ask you, Chad, what do you think you need to do in order to get into the Mile High Club? Uh, being in an airplane. <laughs> you think everybody who has been in an airplane? This, this is one of the easiest clubs. <laughs> have you been in conversations where people are like, I'm in the Mile High Club, and you're like, me too. I went to Adelaide in 2014. <laughs> Surely you know there's another element. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Would you like to mention it? <laughs> Go to the bathroom with someone you're very close to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, famously, the Mile High Club <laughs> describes dual urination. <laughs> Lean over to your wife. Would you like to go to the bathroom at the same time as me? Let's piss at the same time. <laughs> See how streams go into the bit where it's all in at the same time and then they can be like, oh my God, you're my wife's piss. <laughs> that was the, your piss in the, what I assume is a big container in the plane. I've, I've never been down there. I assume what you're, you're trying to avoid uh, mentioning sex, but you're, you're alluding to sex. Most people would say sex on a plane, right? But I don't think... I don't think that's enough in terms of a definition because what if the plane is grounded, right? It's got to be a mile high. It's the mile high club after all. So then I think the definition would be something more like sex plus one mile, right? But even then, plus one mile from what? Plus is unidirectional. It implies unidirectionality. And the 360 degrees need to be accounted for in the definition, right? It doesn't matter where you are on the globe. If you're a mile high and you have sex on a plane, it counts to get into the mile high club. So then the definition needs to be something more like plus or minus sex and one mile from sea level, right? So if that's sea level, then it's either plus one mile from sea level plus having sex or minus one mile from sea level <laughs> minus having sex. But what is minus sex? It's a good question, right? So sex is sex, obviously. Sex minus sex, that's just nothing. That's just zero. Ignore that. Minus sex, I suppose, would be the opposite of sex. And I would describe sex as being about two or more people coming together. So I'd say the opposite of that would be pleasuring yourself. So therefore, I think the definition of the Mile High Club is either having sex on a plane or masturbating on a submarine. <laughs> so the point is, does anyone have a submarine? I've got to get under that club. Uh, so this is an excerpt from an email uh, from a, an old real estate agent that I had a few years ago. And this is after we'd moved out of this place. And I'm not a huge fan of real estate agents. One of the things that annoys me about real estate agents is they always want money out of the bond for irrelevant stuff. They think of it as the landlord's money, I reckon, and they make excuses to try to get money out of it. And this is the stuff that this real estate agent wanted money for after we'd moved out. The thing that annoyed me the most was the pests. She says, I've spotted ants in the kitchen and in the bathroom upstairs. It's the responsibility of tenants to treat slash eradicate I'll send our pest controller to attend. $99 is what the real estate wanted for this ant infestation they reckon they found, right? And I swear to God, when I lived there, I didn't notice any ants. So I responded to this, just saying, could you please send through some evidence of this ant infestation? And this next slide is legitimately what she sent through as evidence of an ant infestation. <laughs> How many ants do you see there, Chad? Three. Three? Well, there's a cheeky fourth one up there. <laughs> But still, $99 for... That's $25 per ant. That's crazy money. I'll flick an ant for two bucks. What are you talking about? So I responded to this, just being like, that hardly constitutes an ant infestation, to which she legitimately replied, there are never just four ants. Which is an insane claim. 
particularly insane coming from someone who recently emailed you a photo of fucking four ants. Also, I looked it up online. There are sometimes four ants. There are sometimes four. Uh, this is my number one favourite comedian, Norm MacDonald. Uh, this is my number two favourite comedian, Maria Bamford. And my number three favourite comedian is the New South Wales Police <laughs> social media team. Oh, we've got some other fans in the room. Yeah, in this country, our police are pretty funny guys, all right? I wanted to show you some of my favourite memes from... Um, most of them are from this article, literally just 18 of the best bloody memes from our Australian police forces. This is one of my favourites. It says, saying married at first sight is on at 7.30, won't get you out of a speeding ticket tonight, slow down. <laughs> this is a meme about how the police have no mercy. So this one, this is an absurdist meme. It says, excuse me, sir, do you know how fast you are going? And then there's a horse with a police hat and police sunglasses. This is an absurdist meme, which makes you imagine a world where horses could understand the responsibilities associated with law enforcement and were also polite. <laughs> this one is an even more absurdist meme. It says, before and after coffee, then there's a sleeping horse and an awake horse. The horses are no longer wearing the hats or the sunglasses. So we can only assume they're undercover. But if you break it down, it's essentially a meme about the stimulating effects of caffeine. This one says, swipes right immediately. This is a meme about how the police fuck dogs. <laughs> is that not what it implies? They posted it, not me. So I'm a big fan of their work, as I said. Some of it I find a bit confounding, if I'm honest, and this is an example. I don't quite get this one. It says, on a scale from one to people eating tuna at work, how annoying are drivers who don't keep left? So I think what they're trying to communicate here is drivers who don't keep left, they're annoying. People who eat tuna at work, they're annoying. But what I find annoying are scales that do not make sense. <laughs> and this scale is from one, a numeral, to people eating tuna at work which is a concept, for it to be a scale, what's in between? There's nothing in between one and people eating tuna. One and people eating... <laughs> like, it's only a scale if there's something in between. I thought about it for quite a while, and I think the most generous reading you could make is that it's a scale of annoyingness. And then one corresponds to one person eating tuna at work, <laughs> and then two, and, th and that would be a linear scale. I think the more people eating tuna at work, the more annoying work would be. If there were 100 people eating tuna at your work, you'd be like, oh my God, this is the most annoying day that there's ever been. So I think I'd put drivers who don't keep left at about 1.8 people eating tuna at work, but only if you let me out a y-axis of police sex with dog. <laughs> Thank you for letting me. <coughs> oh, oh, hey. Thank you. I've realised I've, realized I've gotten more annoying as I've gotten older. When I was younger, I, I, I really tried my hardest not to be annoying and now I don't really care. And the, the way I know that is now when my friends tell me stories about annoying guys they've encountered, I don't get angry for them or annoyed for them. I just get jealous of the annoying guy. And the best example of this was a mate of mine last year. Her headphones broke, like the, the cord snapped on one of the sides of her headphones. And she ordered a guy off Airtasker to come around and he said he could solder the wire back together. So this guy comes around, she pays him 50 bucks. He goes into the uh, kitchen where the um, headphones are with a little soldering gun and he tries for 10 minutes, can't do it, messes it up even worse, comes back into the living room where she is, without asking, sees she has a guitar, picks it up, sits down on her couch, starts singing Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd. <laughs> And my friend's telling me this, like, can you believe this annoying guy? And I'm just jealous of the confidence. <laughs> to advertise a service, take money for the service, fuck up the service, and then sing Wish You Were Here while making eye contact with someone who wishes more than anything that you would die. <laughs> Bit of a numbers update, we're up to three. <laughs> Not too bad, oh yeah. Uh, the most annoying I've, uh, I've ever been probably happened last year. Um, last year I lived with my sister in an apartment and she was moving overseas so I needed to find a new place. And I went uh, to some inspections, I started making rental applications and I found that whole process quite annoying. One of the most annoying things about the, the rental application process was how many references you need to provide. You often need to provide three with every application. You need a reference from your landlord, presumably to prove you're a good tenant. Uh, one from your employer, presumably to prove that you have money. And one personal reference to prove you're a good friend. In case the landlord needs emotional support during the tenancy. 
And so that was all a bit annoying. And I made a few applications. And then I got approved for an apartment. I still had six weeks before I needed to move out, though. And this one was a bit small. I thought maybe I could do better. So I found myself in a unique position where I could mess with a real estate agent. They've, they've screwed me over with the ants and stuff like that before. I'm like, let's have a crack. So I replied to the approval email just saying, could you please send through a reference for the landlord from a previous tenant of theirs? I've proved I'm a good tenant with some references. Let's now see some proof that the landlord is a good person. And the real estate agent responded with this. They said, the owner does not wish to contact the previous tenants and it is not a requirement. Fair enough. All the best with your property search. I'm like, all the best with the property search. I've been approved for this place. But then a minute later, I received this, withdrawn. Dear Tom, we've received advice from you indicating your application has been withdrawn. This message is to confirm we've actioned your request. I didn't make any requests. So I think Stephanie, the real estate agent, has logged in into the software as me and cancelled my approval. And I remember looking at this being like, oh my God, I thought they'd say no. I didn't think they'd just immediately cancel the approval. What if I can't find a new place? I could have really screwed over my life here, but I pushed down my emotions. I composed myself and I did what you're meant to do in these situations. I posted it on social media. <laughs> And believe it or not, within 24 hours, there were news stories about this occurrence. The ABC did one, the renter who asked for his landlord's references. Daily Mail got involved. They said, Aussie bloke has his rental application shot down. By the way, the first time in my life, and probably the last, that I will ever be referred to as an Aussie bloke. <laughs> As a bit of a, a sidebar, a lot of media organisations in Australia and some overseas covered this story. The only one to check with me that any of it was real was the ABC. <laughs> one of the first things they did was email me saying, oh, can you forward the emails that you had with the real estate agent to prove you didn't just make all this up in Photoshop? And I said, sure, and forwarded it through. Every other media organisation that ran with it was like, a comedian said it on TikTok. That sounds like a fact to me. And just... <laughs> it was on TV. I'm like, I know for a fact none of these people have checked with me. The Daily Mail journalist, I spent an hour talking to a guy from the Daily Mail, 50 minutes of which was him complaining about his current landlord. <laughs> In the 10 minutes dedicated to me, he was asking me all these really personal questions, which I think, I think they pad out their articles with specific stuff for like search engine optimization purposes. But he was asking me like what my rent was with my sister, what my rent would have been at the apartment that I applied for and then got knocked back from. He asked me what my address was, all this stuff that I wasn't comfortable sharing, but I also didn't want to get into an argument with him. So I just lied. <laughs> and he printed all of it. <laughs> so it's not a controversial statement, but don't trust what you read in the Daily Mail. <laughs> Lad Bible did a story. The lads. <laughs> the Lad Bible called me a man. <laughs> do you know how affirming that is for someone's masculinity? Could be the highlight of the whole thing, to be honest. The Age did a story, and yes, <laughs> not the best photo. <laughs> I'm not sure if they were deliberately searching for the one where I looked most like a pervert, but <laughs> if they were, they have nailed that. But this is where the language started to change. This one says, Tom Cashman is looking to start a trend that could revolutionise the rental market. <laughs> like, I don't know if that was necessarily my intention. I was just bored on a Tuesday and was trying to annoy one specific real estate agent because I could. But this is when I started getting messages calling me a hero. People were saying, you're a David fighting the Goliath. <laughs> that is the real estate industry. People were messaging me being like, I stand with you in protest. I'm like, I don't know if I stand in protest, but thank you. But in case you were wondering, here's a graph showing people calling you a hero for something you did as a joke over time. As you can see, for the first five days, I was like, oh, this is all a bit much. But on day six, I was like, I am a hero. <laughs> I remember where I was too. I was at a pub on day six talking to a friend and I found myself saying, if I can convince more people to ask for landlord references, it could become vaguely expected in the marketplace. And if it becomes expected in the marketplace, it could legitimately reduce the power imbalance that exists between tenants and landlords. And he was like, why are you talking like this? <laughs> Weren't you joking? And I said, yeah, but I think it came to me because I subconsciously <laughs> sensed injustice. <laughs> Those are real words that came out of my mouth. <laughs> Absolutely disgusting stuff. I don't feel like a hero though, you know, like I don't have big dick energy. I don't have big dick energy, but I do get bad diarrhea easily. So that's <laughs> still pretty cool. That's actually the context in which I felt most like a hero years ago. Uh, is in regards to small penis prejudice. And um, <laughs> I've got your brother. Um, but if, if, 
if you don't believe it's a thing, I'd ask you to think back 15 years. You're not all going to remember this, but particularly the Australians, I reckon you will. About 15 years ago, the Australian government were experiencing an issue with speeding on the nation's roads. Yeah. And they decided to engage a television campaign to combat this very serious issue. Did they interview experts about speeding? Did they talk to victims? Did they talk about how easy it is to speed without realising you're doing it? No, they didn't take any of those approaches. Instead, the thrust of the campaign was that if you speed, you've got a small dick, fuck you. <laughs> Do you remember this? It was just a bunch of women with their pinkies out being like, that's your penis. That's your penis, you idiot. You do a criminal act, you get a criminally small penis. We're the government, by the way. That's your dick. That's your stupid dick. I just remember being like 15 years old, watching that on TV at home, being like, that's actually pretty big. I need to get into speeding, are you kidding? You go fast, you look cool, your dick doubles in size. Do we remember this ad, though? Yeah. yeah, thank you. It's a real thing. Is that why we pay taxes? <laughs> I work hard. I give some of my money to the government for them to make expensive videos about how my penis is ridiculous. <laughs> I looked this up more recently. This is a real ad that happened years ago. I looked it up, and what I'm about to say is true. You can look it up, too. That campaign, that You've Got a Stupid Little Penis campaign, is the most successful road safety <laughs> campaign <laughs> In Australia's history, road deaths plummeted, speeding rates plummeted. So now when I go home with a girl, I get naked. I say, yes, it may be small, but think how many lives it saved. <laughs> the point is that my dick is the hero. <laughs> That's a uh, graphic. That's just the, the legend there. And the other legend there. <laughs> and if, if, if anyone's worried, um, this should reassure you, this is um, a graph of the penis-based material in the show. So it's almost over, and that's when it became too much. Because it looks a bit... Yep, you get it. Um, good, good, good. But it was weird being in the media in this positive light when pretty much the opposite thing happened to me about six months before that, right? So this is a true story. About six months before the landlord reference thing, I lived with my sister, as I said, and she was busy with work and exams, and I thought as a nice treat for her, I'll get a cleaner to do a good clean of the apartment we lived in, right? So I booked a cleaner online, the cleaner comes around, I showed them the apartment, and then I left. I didn't tell them anything about the household rubbish. I didn't think about that, I probably should have. But basically what happened, unbeknownst to me, is the cleaners took the household rubbish, they went into the street in front of the apartment building. They couldn't find the big bins, so they just left the trash on the street, which is bad, right? I want to acknowledge that's bad, that's annoying for the neighbours. Look, that, that, I want to acknowledge that is bad and annoying for the neighbours. In terms of how annoying, on the people eating tuna <laughs> at work spectrum. I'd put it at about seven, people eating tuna at work. Um, it's still medium on the police sex with dog <laughs> spectrum. That's not because it's involved in this story, but just based on the meme from earlier, we can only assume it's still going on. So I think that's <laughs> important to reflect in the data. But so I didn't know about that. I got back and the apartment was clean, paid the cleaners online, went about my week. And about a week later, I received an envelope in the mail addressed to me, and there were three pieces of paper in this envelope. The first piece of paper was that photo. The second piece of paper was this photo of another envelope addressed to me. So what's happened is someone's gone through the trash, found an envelope with my name on it, and been like, this guy's the culprit. The third piece of paper in the envelope is a letter, typed out letter, addressed to me. It's not just any letter, it is the most psychotic letter <laughs> you will ever see in your life, I guarantee. It starts out pretty polite and nice, but let's just say it takes a little bit of a turn. I'll show you some of it. It starts out saying, the attached photos show five messy, unpleasant, smelly, split and leaking bags of household garbage dumped in Barkham Avenue, Darlinghurst. They also show the garbage contains correspondence addressed to you from Comsec and AFX, which means the garbage is most likely yours. <laughs> if so, what a total cunt you are. A total cunt. A moronic, antisocial, subhuman, irresponsible Neanderthal with no concept of acceptable community behaviour. No doubt you live like a pig too. With social habits to match. P.U. What a stink you must leave wherever you go. My favourite part of this is the if so. Because it's like, if so, you're a subhuman Neanderthal. If not, good on you. I don't know. Sorry about this intense letter. 
So I remember reading this. I'm like, oh my God, this guy knows my name. He knows where I live. He's very angry. I'm going to die. He's going to kill me tomorrow. <laughs> but I pushed down my emotions. I composed myself and I did what you're meant to do in these situations. I posted it on social media. <laughs> and journalists got in touch about this as well. Believe it or not, not as many as the landlord reference thing, but still a few. And you can see why. It's pretty good clickbait. It's the most psychotic letter I've ever seen. But I had a decision to make in terms of whether to talk to these journalists, right? Because on the one hand, it doesn't make me look very good, this story. I should have told the cleaners not to put the trash on the street. And it makes me look bad. But on the other hand, I wanted to get back at this guy. This guy clearly lives near me. He didn't sign off on the letter. I don't know who he is. I thought maybe if I go to the press, he'll think twice about doing this to someone else. And as, as you could predict, it backfired on me. <laughs> It backfired hard. I spoke to a few journalists. The first headline of the first article that came out about this, this was the headline, Sydney comedian Tom Cashman sent deranged note... Makes it sound like I sent it. <laughs> the second one isn't much better. Subhuman man receives... Makes it seem like Yahoo News agrees that I'm a subhuman. Even worse, if you Googled my name at the time, the top result was that I sent a deranged note. So in the space of six months, when I was trying to be annoying, I was called a hero. When I was trying to be nice, I was called a stinky pig subhuman <laughs> Neanderthal. But it's okay because that benefits my reputation and that is funny. <laughs> so I got kicked out of that first apartment, but I still had six weeks to look for a new apartment. So I wasn't too worried, if I'm honest, and I kind of dilly-dallied. And then I started speaking with a friend of mine about potentially moving into a two-bedroom place, and then we dilly-dallied, and then I left it until I had a week left before I needed to move out from the place with my sister. And then we started frantically going to inspections, me and my friend, on the Monday and Tuesday. On the Monday morning, we went to one that we liked. We immediately made an application, and that afternoon, I got a text from the real estate agent at this new place. He says, can you send me a bank statement? I said, sure, I've just emailed you one. He said, sending the apps to the owner. Any requests before I send it off? I said, sounds good, thanks. None I can think of. That's when he says, are you going to ask me for a landlord reference? <laughs> I'm like, great. I'm famous amongst real estate agents for being the most annoying tenant there ever was. Perfect. Then I thought, maybe he's just joking around. He was a younger guy. I met him at the inspection. I'm like, maybe he's just joshing. So I'll, I'll reply in a jovial way. I'm like, ha, 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 no. That has not worked out well for me in the past. Of course, if the landlord has one lying around, I wouldn't mind having a peek. I'm just trying to be funny. He goes, ah, ha, ha, no worries. I thought that was a good sign. He checked I was legitimately interested in the property, which is fair enough. I said I was. And he says, no problem. We should have approval shortly. I'm like, hell yeah. That's a good sign. The next morning, we received this. Congratulations. Dear Thomas, and I blocked out my friend's name, but let's just say... We're up to four. <laughs> congratulations, you've been approved for tenancy. I'm like, fantastic, we've got a place. Last minute, I call the real estate agent. He says, congratulations. We arrange a time the next day for me to come and pick up the keys. I'm like, perfect, saga over. But that afternoon, I received this. Unsuccessful. Good afternoon, Thomas. Strange turn of events. The owner has decided not to proceed with your application. I've asked for a reason why. They've told me we would like to continue our search. I've done my best to convince them, but their decision is final. I'm very sorry for this outcome. I'm looking at this. I've got three days now before I need to move out of my old place. I'm like, it was funny before. It's not funny now. I'm going to have to move in with my dad or something. I've completely screwed over my life here, but I pushed down my emotions. I composed myself. <laughs> And I did what you're meant to do in these situations. I posted it on social media. And there were articles about this too. News.com got involved. Daily Mail did one saying there was a bizarre twist in the landlord reference saga. And as I was looking for a new apartment, I was doing multiple interviews with different journalists and I pretty much said the same thing to all of them. I said, it's clear what's happened here. The landlord at this new place has done a last minute Google of my name and they've seen that I'm a David who fights the Goliath. <laughs> That is the real estate agency. And they don't like that I am a rental rights advocate and they don't want me under their roof. And it's only occurred... To, I'm on record saying that to multiple journalists. It only occurred to me months after that if you Googled my name at the time, still one of the top results <laughs> that I sent a deranged note over a rubbish dispute. Like, I thought the landlord was looking at this being like, this guy is my political adversary. When it's quite likely they were looking at this and thinking... This guy is a stinky, stinky pig. This guy's an extremely stinky pig. I got caught a lot of things last year. This is another true story, probably the, maybe the worst, uh, most insulting thing that happened to me. I was doing a show last year, uh, like this one, right? It was a showcase show, and uh, I did pretty well on the night. You know, not to brag. Oh, thank you. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Round of applause for how well I did at this other show. 
Uh, so I did pretty well. And then the next day, I got a, a message from someone I didn't know on Instagram, a woman, and she said, Hi, Tom, I'm a TV producer. You don't know me, but I was at the show last night and I thought you were so funny and I think you'd be perfect for this project that I'm working on coming up. And I was like, oh, my God. She's like, tell me your number and I'll give you a ring this afternoon. I'm like, fantastic. This could be my big break. I give her my number. She calls me that afternoon. She's gassing me up again. She's been like, oh, my God, you were so funny at this show. You're perfect for this thing I'm working on. It's called Beauty and the Geek. <laughs> And I don't know what was worse, the fact that a professional in the industry has identified me as one of the biggest dorks in Australia. Or the two or three seconds where I legitimately thought to myself, maybe I'm a beauty. She is yet to specify the role that I will be playing. Don't you think that's fucked up though? You can't just call random people and say that. Like, that's an insult. Like, the guys on the show, they consent to being referred to as geeks. I didn't consent to shit. It'd be like if I got Chad's number off the ticketing website or something and call you tomorrow like, oh, the banter we had was awesome, man. I'd love to work with you again. I think you'd be perfect for this show that I'm working on. It's called The Coolest Guy. <laughs> and the biggest fucking loser you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> oh, which role would you be playing? How about you guess which role you'd be playing? I was like, what? But I pushed down my emotions. I composed myself. But I didn't post about this, but I did push down my emotions and I thought to myself, look, it's a bit insulting, but I've also always been curious about how reality shows recruit and I thought it'd be funny. So I'm like, I'm going to try and get as far in the beauty and the geek <laughs> recruitment process as possible. Still, some friends accuse me of being desperate to be on Beauty and the Geek. I didn't want to be on Beauty and the Geek. I was joking. <laughs> Fuck off. So I'm like, yeah, I'd be keen. And it was pretty interesting pretty quickly. One of the first things she tried to do, this producer on the phone, was break up the relationship I was in at the time. She, she was like, do you have a girlfriend? I'm like, yeah. She's like, how serious is it? She's like, it would be great if you could find love on the show. Have you, thought, have you ever gone open before? I'm like, I'm not breaking up with my girlfriend to go on Beauty and the Geek, I'm sorry. That's a conversation I refuse to have. I'm not sitting my girlfriend down like, it's not you. It's also not me. It's Sophie Monk. She wants me in suspenders. It's going to be hilarious. Then she went on. She went on a big spiel about how subtle the show was going to be. She was like, the first series, it was so unsubtle. The, the geeks were so geeky, you know? Like, the beauties were so beautiful. In this one, it's going to be virtually indistinguishable. Which is which? I don't know if you watched it. It's come out subsequently. It was not subtle. It made Love on the Spectrum look like The Bachelor. It was crazy. <laughs> It was not a subtle program. But I'm just agreeing. I'm like, sounds good. And then I got to the next round, right? So the next round was a Zoom interview with a more senior producer. And for this one, I prepared. So for this one, the morning of, I went to a news agent and I bought a poster of the superhero Deadpool <laughs> riding a unicorn, <laughs> shooting an Uzi. And I, I put that up behind me on the wall so she could see it like over my shoulder, like it looked accidental. I've got a, I got, I've got a photo of it. That's it there. <laughs> About five minutes in, she asked what it was. When I explained, I've never seen a smile that wide in my life. Wow. Oh, very nice. I breezed through that interview. And then I got to the final interview. I got to the final stage uh, to get on Beauty and the Geek. It was an in-studio interview with like five different producers, including the executive producer, the most senior person who works on the show. There was another head honcho guy up on a screen. And for that one, I was really nervous. Not because I wanted to be on Beauty and the Geek. <laughs> Uh, because I just get really nervous in interviews, in part because the first job interview I ever did was the most terrifying experience, and I think I'll be scarred for the rest of my life. I'll tell you for context, this is the worst job interview story you'll ever hear, I guarantee it. Basically what happened, I was like 21 at the time, one of the first interviews I'd ever done. One of the first times, I think maybe the first time I'd ever worn a suit at all. So I was very intimidated by the formality of the whole thing. It was at a fancy law firm for like an internship position. I was very intimidated by the formality. Went up there and it was in like a big boardroom, big fancy boardroom with a big boardroom table, fancy leather chairs around the boardroom table, four lawyers across from me. I was very intimidated, but I started out, I was going okay, very nervous. About 20 minutes into this interview, I get a text on my phone and it went off. I'd forgotten to put my phone on silent. So there was just like a big bing. And I'm like, God, that's unprofessional. So I didn't acknowledge the bing and just kept answering the question. But then I realized my settings on my iPhone at the time meant that if I didn't check it in the next two minutes, it was gonna go off again. 
and then again and again every two minutes. And in my mind, I can't acknowledge that because I ignored the first bing. And so if I acknowledge that now, they're going to know that I ignored the bing and that I can't be trusted. So I'm like, okay, I've got 90 seconds to surreptitiously get the phone out and put it on silent under the table without them noticing. So I tried to get it out and I put it on silent and then I didn't want to move my shoulder more to like put it back in my pocket. So I thought I'll just put it on the chair behind me and at the end of the interview, I'll be like, oh, my phone fell out of my pocket. Like that's not unprofessional for your phone to fall out of your pocket. Perfect plan. God knows what my answers were while I'm thinking all this. <laughs> so about 20 minutes after that, the interview gets the vibe that it's about to wrap up. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to have to do some acting here. Like if I don't sell the authenticity of noticing the phone, they're going to know about the whole scheme. And that's even more deceitful. I've really got to be authentic when I notice this phone. So get ready to act. So then the interview ends. Four people stand up. They come around. I shake all four of their hands. And then I do a big, oh, would you look at that? But as I'm like, oh, would you look at that? I look down at this leather chair and there's a puddle of sweat in the shape of my ass. There's even a gap where my ass crack was. The phone was up to the side. You could barely see it. It was the same colour as the chair. So from their perspective, I've just been like, ta-da. What do you think about that, fellas? What do you think the next candidate's going to think sitting in that? Does that affect my chances at all? They're all looking like, why? Why would, he, why would he point that out? I then looked down, I'm like, oh my God. I grabbed the phone. I don't think they ever saw the phone. Then felt so awkward, didn't know what to do. Went back in for a second handshake. They're like, no, 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 no. We don't want to touch you, sweaty boy. I thought they were waving. So I backed out of the room waving. Yeah. So that's the energy I was taking into the beauty and the geek audition so I was really nervous and I thought they were gonna beg me to be on the show because in my mind I'd been scouted right but these are different producers than the one who asked me so they thought I was gonna beg to be on the show so it became quite awkward and I think to, to get rid of that awkwardness the executive producer she went on this spiel about how cool geeks are these days she's like geeks are they're cool now they're in the cool basket these days she's like you know all the cool geeks like uh, Big Bang Theory <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg I'm like <laughs> I'm like, these are not cool people. <laughs> but then five minutes after that, the same woman asked me what I assume was one of the standard questions that she asked everyone. She's like, okay, what's the geekiest thing about you? And what's the coolest thing about you? And I said, well, hang on, before you were saying geeks are cool, and now you're using those terms as if they're opposites on a spectrum. <laughs> and she said, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I realised I was perfect for the show. <laughs> So I've been kicked out of that first apartment for being a rental rights advocate, a David who fights the Goliath. I got kicked out of the second apartment either for that or for being a stinky pig, we're still not sure. And now I've got three days to look for an apartment and I'm frantically calling real estate agents. I'm trying to arrange private inspections. I go to three inspections, I make two applications, I get approved for one and I pay a deposit, I get the keys. With one day left, I'm like, thank God, found a place, saga over at least for about three weeks, right? And then about three weeks after that, I receive a text from a friend of mine who lives in the ACT, basically a state here in Australia, and it's just a screenshot of a headline. And this is the headline, how a Sydney comedian's TikTok inspired a rental rights motion. <laughs> I'm like, what? I Googled it, there's another article. No joke, Pedersen sees merit in comedian's landlord references idea. Again, joke, not idea. <laughs> So basically what's happened is that guy, Michael Pedersen, who's a politician, wanted to introduce a motion to the Legislative Assembly, which is the lower house in the ACT Parliament, to find a way to allow tenants to provide references about their landlords. Again, I was joking. I was just being annoying. But what I've realised is that's how I live my life. And that's what activism is. I just... Some... So I looked up what has to happen for a motion to get passed in the ACT and it turns out they have to debate it in Parliament and it turns out that was happening the next week and it was also going to be live streamed on the Parliament website. So I was there watching live <laughs> and I was also screen recording. So now I'd like to play you some videos from Parliament <laughs> where they're discussing whether to make my joke a law. <laughs> so this is the first guy to speak. And I believe that making landlords provide a reference written by previous tenants is another way that we can empower tenants. The response to this idea when it was first put out there by a comedian over a month ago was profoundly positive. This motion is about giving a little more power back to renters and I urge all members of this place to support it. So that's Michael Pedersen, that's the guy who suggested it. Like, I didn't want this to be a law, but now it's on the cards. I'm watching this being like, yes, Michael. <laughs> Let's do it, Michael. 
Then the floor was open for other people to speak and this was the next guy to go. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and I rise to speak in support of Mr Pedersen's motion. I'm like, hell yeah, that's one in support. He goes on to say what he thinks a landlord reference requirement would achieve. It gets us closer to a, dare I say, a utopia. <laughs> No, 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 no. I was bored on a Tuesday, I swear. Now actual politicians are standing on record being like, it will lead us to utopia. Like, like we all need to calm down a little bit. Thankfully, the next guy to speak was a conservative politician. And let's just say he was not as much of a fan. I am absolutely staggered. This motion is actually a joke. And that's how it started. That's genuinely how it started. He is not wrong. <laughs> I cannot fault him there. He goes on. It's no great surprise that the inspiration for today's motion came directly from TikTok. This motion's inspired by the Sydney comedian Tom Cashman. So he's boo-booing this law because it came from a comedian and it came from TikTok. I googled this guy, his name is Mark Parton. The third result when I googled him was this headline. Liberal MLA Mark Parton apologises <laughs> for KFC TikTok video. Very interesting. Well, I thought it was so interesting, I spent $30 subscribing to the Canberra Times to find out more. And basically what happened is this guy, he posted a TikTok, he has a TikTok account, interesting, and he posted a TikTok that used footage from Parliament of him in a way that made it seem like it was an ad for KFC, which is not allowed, and he got in trouble and he did, had to take the TikTok down. But I found it. <laughs> So now I would like to play Mark Parton's KFC TikTok video. Members, I understand that it is the wish of the Assembly to suspend for lunch. That being the case, the chair will be resumed at 2pm. Did someone say KFC? I don't care. What the fuck is going on in Canberra? And where was that I don't care, I love it attitude <laughs> when it came to my law? He went on. I jokingly said to Mr Pedersen yesterday that I'd consulted with Tom Cashman and he thought I was serious. I, I mean, I, I, I didn't. Well, maybe he should have. <laughs> maybe he should have, because then it went to a vote. Question is that the motion be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. <laughs> May I remind you, Stephanie said it is not a requirement. Not only is there a world where this spreads and it becomes a requirement, there's a world where if she doesn't do the requirement, she goes to prison. I don't think anyone's ever been more vindicated in the history of the planet. I actually looked up vindication on Wikipedia and the definition is... Pretty interesting. Now I think all my jokes should be laws, you know? It should be illegal to call anyone a geek over the phone. It should be illegal to knock back any employment application on the basis of arse sweatiness. And I would like a government apology for the stupid little penis road safety campaign. So I called that guy, Michael Pedersen, to see if he could arrange that as well. Hi there, I'm Michael Pedersen. I'd like to announce that we will not be making it illegal to call someone a geek over the phone. And we will absolutely not be issuing a government apology for the pinky road safety campaign. However, I can confirm that sometimes there are just four ants. Just four ants. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks for coming, appreciate it. But in Berlin, you would end up just living under a bridge with that attitude. The housing crisis is real. Says it's going to be okay. Feisty Bree responds by saying, same with California. Aquatic 14 says, same with Canada. 
and and verbs are good says same in Australia and New Zealand. severely back up my argument, wouldn't it? <laughs> what do you mean? Like if I answered straight up, I, if I saw the four ants. Oh, right, so you're, so you're referring to when you said there were three, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then I said there were actually four, and there was a big laugh. Yeah. And you thought, well, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> what if I hadn't said that? It just wouldn't have been as funny. <laughs> Thank you, Chad. 